intelligence. 5. Second appearance to the apostles. Thomas spent a lonesome week alone with himself in the hills around about Olivet. During this time he saw only those at Simon's house and John Mark. It was about nine o'clock on Saturday, April 15, when the two apostles found him and took him back with them to their rendezvous at the Mark home. The next day Thomas listened to the telling of the stories of the Master's various appearances, but he steadfastly refused to believe. He maintained that Peter had enthused them into thinking they had seen the Master. Nathaniel reasoned with him, but it did no good. There was an emotional stubbornness associated with his customary doubtfulness, and this state of mind, coupled with his chagrin at having run away from them, conspired to create a situation of isolation which even Thomas himself did not fully understand. He had withdrawn from his fellows, he had gone his own way, and now, even when he was back among them, he unconsciously tended to assume an attitude of disagreement. He was slow to surrender, he disliked to give in. Without intending it, he really enjoyed the attention paid him. He derived unconscious satisfaction from the efforts of all his fellows to convince and convert him. He had missed them for a full week, and he obtained considerable pleasure from their persistent attentions. They were having their evening meal a little after six o'clock, with Peter sitting on one side of Thomas and Nathaniel on the other, when the doubting apostle said, I will not believe unless I see the master with my own eyes and put my finger in the mark of the nails. As they thus sat at supper, and while the doors were securely shut and barred, the Marantia master suddenly appeared inside the curvature of the table and, standing directly in front of Thomas, said, Peace be upon you. For a full week have I tarried that I might appear again when you were all present to hear once more the commission to go into all the world and preach this gospel of the kingdom. Again I tell you, as the Father sent me into the world, so send I you. As I have revealed the Father, so shall you reveal the divine love, not merely with words, but in your daily living. I send you forth not to love the souls of men, but rather to love men. You are not merely to proclaim the joys of heaven, but also to exhibit in your daily experience these spirit realities of the divine life, since you already have eternal life, as the gift of God through faith. When you have faith, when power from on high, the Spirit of Truth, has come upon you, you will not hide your light here behind closed doors. You will make known the love and the mercy of God to all mankind. Through fear you now flee from the facts of a disagreeable experience. But when you shall have been baptized with the Spirit of Truth, you will bravely and joyously go forth to meet the new experiences of proclaiming the good news of eternal life in the kingdom of God. You may tarry here and in Galilee for a short season while you recover from the shock of the transition from the false security of the authority of traditionalism to the new order of the authority of the facts, truth, and faith in the supreme realities of living experience. Your mission to the world is founded on the fact that I lived a God-revealing life among you, on the truth that you and all other men are the sons of God and it shall consist in the life which you will live among men, the actual and living experience of loving men and serving them, even as I have loved and served you. Let faith reveal your light to the world. Let the revelation of truth open the eyes blinded by tradition. Let your loving service effectually destroy the prejudice engendered by ignorance. By so drawing close to your fellow men in understanding sympathy and with unselfish devotion, you will lead them into a saving knowledge of the Father's love. The Jews have extolled goodness. The Greeks have exalted beauty. The Hindus preach devotion. The faraway ascetics teach reverence. The Romans demand loyalty. But I require of my disciples life, even a life of loving service for your brothers in the flesh. When the Master had so spoken, he looked down into the face of Thomas and said, And you, Thomas, who said you would not believe unless you could see me and put your finger in the nail marks of my hands, have now beheld me and heard my words, and though you see no nail marks on my hands, since I am raised in the form that you also shall have when you depart from this world, what will you say to your brethren? You will acknowledge the truth, 
for already in your heart you had begun to believe even when you so stoutly asserted your unbelief. Your doubts, Thomas, always most stubbornly assert themselves just as they are about to crumble. Thomas, I bid you be not faithless but believing, and I know you will believe even with a whole heart. When Thomas heard these words, he fell on his knees before the Morancha master and exclaimed, I believe, my Lord and my master. Then said Jesus to Thomas, You have believed, Thomas, because you have really seen and heard me. Blessed are those in the ages to come who will believe even though they have not seen with the eye of flesh, nor heard with the mortal ear. And then as the master's form moved over near the head of the table, he addressed them all, saying, And now go all of you to Galilee, where I will presently appear to you. After he said this, he vanished from their sight. The eleven apostles were now fully convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead, and very early the next morning, before the break of day, they started out for Galilee. 6. The Alexandrian Appearance While the eleven apostles were on the way to Galilee, drawing near their journey's end, on Tuesday evening, April 18, at about half-past eight o'clock, Jesus appeared to Rodan and some eighty other believers in Alexandria. This was the Master's twelfth appearance in Morancha form. Jesus appeared before these Greeks and Jews at the conclusion of the report of David's messenger regarding the crucifixion. This messenger, being the fifth in the Jerusalem-Alexandria relay of runners, had arrived in Alexandria late that afternoon, and when he had delivered his message to Rodan, it was decided to call the believers together to receive this tragic word from the messenger himself. At about eight o'clock, the messenger, Nathan of Bucyrus, came before this group and told them in detail all that had been told him by the preceding runner. Nathan ended his touching recital with these words, But David, who sends us this word, reports that the master, in foretelling his death, declared that he would rise again. Even as Nathan spoke, the Morancha master appeared there in full view of all, and when Nathan sat down, Jesus said, Peace be upon you. That which my Father sent me into the world to establish belongs not to a race, a nation, nor to a special group of teachers or preachers. This gospel of the kingdom belongs to both Jew and Gentile, to rich and poor, to free and bond, to male and female, even to the little children. And you are all to proclaim this gospel of love and truth by the lives which you live in the flesh. You shall love one another with a new and startling affection, even as I have loved you. You will serve mankind with a new and amazing devotion, even as I have served you. And when men see you so love them, and when they behold how fervently you serve them, they will perceive that you have become faith fellows of the kingdom of heaven, and they will follow after the spirit of truth which they see in your lives, to the finding of eternal salvation. As the Father sent me into this world, even so now send I you. You were all called to carry the good news to those who sit in darkness. This gospel of the kingdom belongs to all who believe it. It shall not be committed to the custody of mere priests. Soon will the Spirit of truth come upon you, and he shall lead you into all truth. Go you, therefore, into all the world preaching this gospel, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. When the Master had so spoken, he vanished from their sight. All that night these believers remained there together, recounting their experiences as kingdom believers, and listening to the many words of Rodin and his associates. And they all believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Imagine the surprise of David's herald of the resurrection, who arrived the second day after this, when they replied to his announcement, saying, Yes, we know, for we have seen him. He appeared to us day before yesterday.